right, so we're starting the book of Ephesians tonight. So may the meditations, uh, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. I may speak softly, but I carry a big stick. I love to carry a stick around. I thought we could start out looking at uh, just a little introduction to the letter to the Ephesians. Just finding Ephesus, first of all, the ancient world here. I, I'll have another map. Maybe it's a little easier. I like it because it has a ship on it, of course. You've got Italy over here, you've got Israel over here, modern-day Turkey and modern-day Greece with all its islands, Egypt, of course, down here. Where is Ephesus? You probably already know, but if you don't, it's right there, uh, right over in this area, which would be called Asia in the ancient times. This is modern-day Turkey, Istanbul being up here, the Aegean Sea over here. This is the Ionian Sea, a Adriatic Sea, or Ionian, I think, too. You can travel across to Greece. Corinth is over here, but Ephesus is over in this direction, right there. It's a little blurry, but there's another picture here. It makes it a little simpler. <laughs> That's better, but it doesn't have a ship on it, so I don't really like it as much. Nevertheless, there's Ephesus, you can see right there. There's Athens, Corinth over here, Rome. So Ephesus is right about in that spot, and I have a few pictures of uh, Ephesus ancient Ephesus in modern times. We still have ruins. Have you been there to Ephesus? Who's been to Ephesus? You guys have been to Ephesus, so this could have been you, these pictures here. So have, have you walked down this street? So here are some of the ancient columns, porticos, which would be columns, uh, colonnades with uh, roofs on it, uh, of, of uh, rows of you know, wide streets with uh, columns and roofs, very beautiful city was a super, super populous city. 200,000 lived in it in ancient times. It had aqueducts, aqueducts, which would carry a, just funnel massive amounts of water down into the city for the 200,000 that lived in that area. This, we're going to see a better picture of it in a moment. That's the library, which was, I think, donated by one of the Roman emperors. Um, this city was super affluent, uh, super uh, wealthy. It was right on a trade route between the, and the eastern trade routes. It was located on the Keister River. It had an inner harbor there about three miles from the sea. And uh, today it's been silted up over time that the silt has come up and filled the harbor. But in those days it had a harbor that connected it to the sea on the trade routes about three miles to the sea. Really beautiful, really glorious. Uh, great place in terms of affluence, not a great place in terms of religion, of course, because the main uh, worship of Artemis or Diana, one of the ancient Greek gods and Roman gods, uh, was worshipped there. Uh, I'll show you a picture of the temple of Artemis, which no longer exists. We have some of these things. I threw this picture up there, even though it was already what we have seen. But I thought when I was looking on Google Images, doesn't that look like Mace Windall <laughs> from our church? Because he, I was like, May, what are you doing in this picture? I'll have to show that picture to her later. There's the, uh, so this is called the uh, Celsus Library. That was at least part of the library. It's still existing now. You can see how beautiful it was. If this was new and not 2,000 years old, my, how beautiful this city must have looked. At least uh, to the outward eye, maybe not the inward eye. Here is the Temple of Artemis. It was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was twice the size of the Parthenon in Greece. Can you, have you been to the Parthenon? That was huge. This was even about twice its size. I think it was uh, something around 400-ish feet long, 210-ish feet wide or so. It was one of the things that made the city uh, famous, built by the Lydian king Croesus in the mid-6th century B.C., apparently. Yep, one of the seven wonders of the world. And <laughs> Shall I jump to that part now? Is that still around when Paul was there? Yes, I believe so. Yeah, yeah, yeah because they were, um, of course, we can read that account, actually, in Acts 19. Maybe I'll just... Well, that was, that was, oh, no, that's that was close. That's Athens, right? That's just across the water. Um, well, I'll just show you one other picture here first, and then we'll jump back to this one. Here's the theater. Can you imagine that? It could seat 25,000 people. 
almost enough for a Trump rally. Not quite, but pretty close. <laughs> Anything else that could seat, pretty much. But consider, in Acts 19, we read, After these events, Paul resolved in the Spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia. Uh, just other words, basically, for Greece. And uh, go to Jerusalem, saying, After I've been there, I must also see Rome, etc. Um, about that time, there, there arose no little stir concerning the way. Christians were called followers of the way before they were called Christians. First called Christians at Antioch, remember? For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver uh, shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together, while the workmen of like occupation, other silversmiths for Artemis, said, Men, do you know that from this business, sorry, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see in here that not only at Ephesus, but also throughout all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable company of people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may count for nothing, and that she may be even de deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and worship, the world worship. Wow, that's a powerful testimony to Paul's preaching. One man was enough to turn almost the entire of Asia to dismiss and reject Artemis. And so he's upset about that, mostly because he's, he's not going to have any money left, because that's what he does. He makes silver idols for Artemis. So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed together into the theater. This place, you can see it, you can go there now dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. I mean, can you imagine? Paul would have seen this theater. You can go and stand in that theater today. Gaius and Aristarchus were there. And this all happened in this theater many years ago. Paul wished to go in among the crowd. Where was he? Well, you think he was right over in this portico heading into the, uh, this great theater where everybody's having a... Uh, a riot basically over this and the whole city's in uproar and people are shoutings and it's a mad riot and he's over here let me in let me at him let me at him let me at him to preach and they're having to hold him back my goodness he was a man of uh of uh, great virility and, and christian stirrings when they heard this they were enraged and cried out great is artemis of the ephesians so the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed together into the theater. Okay, I did that part. Paul wished to go in among the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Some of the Asiarchs also, who were his friends, sent to him and begged him not to venture into the theater. In other words, they'll tear you to pieces, Paul. They'll kill you. Now someone cried one, some cried one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them didn't know why they'd come together. You know? So typical, isn't it? There's a riot. Well, let's go see what's going on. This is cool. It's a lot more exciting. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander motioned with his hand, wishing to make a defense to the people. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, uh, for about two hours, they all, with one voice, cried out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians, for two hours. Wow. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there who doesn't know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? I wonder what that is. I guess a meteor that they considered was sacred from Zeus or whatever. Seeing then these, that these things cannot be contradicted, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open, and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we are in danger of being charged with rioting today, there being no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and having exhorted them, took leave of them and departed for Macedonia. So that all took place in this letter we're about to read. So, and in this theater, in the, in the, this is the temple. This is the theater that all that took place. And um, you think that these things are very far from removed from us, right? Artemis, 2,000 years ago. Who is that? Who is she to us? Well, who is she to us? You ready for the big reveal? <laughs> Wonder Woman. Remember of... 
Diana. So she, they didn't even change her name when they made this superhero. She is Diana. Uh, she's Artemis of the Ephesians, basically. For modern consumption, they just took off a few of her clothes, gave her a semi-bikini, and made it in red, white, and blue stars and stripes. But you notice, actually see her tiara sort of crown here? She was always depicted, hang on, do I have the picture? Yeah, she was Wonder Woman. She was depicted in ancient times with that same crown, if you watch right here. Isn't that interesting? When I grew up, and a lot of the superheroes we have in our, in our culture, and I've said this to you before, but I'll say it again, because I don't have a lot of new information. The Super Friends, I watched the Hall of Justice when I was a little boy. I loved that, I loved that show. I still kind of like the opening intro, because it was about justice and the American way and fighting for the right and doing good. And, but what are these superheroes? They are just the ancient gods, the ancient pantheon recast and refigured for the modern American consumption. Americanized and made a little bit more Christian in some ways and made for justice, but still, who are they? If you think about it, Superman is Zeus. Aquaman is Poseidon or Neptune. Wonder Woman is Artemis of the Ephesians, Diana. And over here you even have Hermes, Flash, right? They didn't even change his outfit. If you look at the ancient drawings of, of uh, Hermes, or Mercury, the messenger of the gods, he has lightning bolts. He rides on lightning bolts. They didn't even change it. And when I watched the original Super Friends intro some time ago, I was struck a few years ago. The earliest ones from the early 1970s said um, something like a cast of heroes drawn from the legends of the universe. And I thought, whoa, I never realized as a boy the legends of the universe equals Greek and Roman mythology. That's where they got these guys. Though they've been slightly Americanized and they've gotten a lot darker. You know, Superman's costume has gotten darker every Superman they make. Now he looks like a vampire. Batman's costumes have gotten darker and darker and darker over the years. Now he looks like a demon. He used to look like just a, you know, superhero. Same with Aquaman. He looked all bright and cheery here, and he gets darker and darker with our modern times. So the world's getting worse that way. I kind of liked some of these superheroes, I gotta admit, growing up, especially Aquaman. I wanted to talk to the whales and swim with the fishes, but nevertheless, great as Artemis of the Ephesians, that book, Jonathan Kahn, remember I had a whole talk on that, but he talks about the gods, uh, what is that, the um, return of the gods? They never really went anywhere, frankly. <laughs> these, there are demons behind these gods. They've been around and they've just, I think, put themselves into the modern world for catching the imagination of the youths to get them interested in the ancient gods. I think the gods or the demons behind these things are like, hey, let's rebrand ourselves for the American Christian and see if we can catch them up in, in this, in, in our ancient theology. We'll, we'll bring them back into the pantheon of the Greeks and the Romans. Even though people don't really believe in Superman and stuff like they did in the old days uh, with Zeus, but kind of it's an idol worship type of thing. No, I don't know of anything. I think that was American, as far as I know. Hercules, yeah. Yeah. So I'm sure there's some other parallels somewhere in there. But you notice she's got the same even. So she, this is an ancient statue of her. She was always depicted with, uh, she was a hunter, a huntress. She usually had dogs with her. Uh, she'd have arrows, huntress. And she was also for fertility. She was, she was you know, sex and babies and all that kind of stuff. Okay, we did that. Also, we have Artemis, the greatest Artemis of Cape Canaveral, right? <laughs> you notice all those names of the rockets are always ancient gods, the Gemini, Saturn, Apollo, Mercury. Mercury. Now we've got Artemis. Too bad, I wish they chose, you know, Johnny, Willie, Teddy, Fred or something, but they chose these things. Okay, you don't need anything else, huh? It is. Maybe so, yeah. So at any rate, I'm going to close this out. We don't need this anymore for tonight. And we'll just get into some other stuff now. So I find that fascinating, though. 
especially since I was so duped into loving some of these things earlier on, and I still kind of like Superman and, and, and Aquaman, at least in the old Super Friends way. They were kind of, seemed like they were good guys, but even so, I think I've seen through it now into what's really going on. Okay, my other sheet here. Oops. Okay, so the book of Ephesians. I've got an intro to the city so far and to some of the uh, atmosphere of that area, but Ephesians is maybe my favorite letter. I don't know, I may, I like Romans. I don't know, if I had to choose one, it'd probably be Romans, but if, if I had to take it with me on a ship and I could only take one with me to a deserted island because it has everything in Romans. But I mean, Ephesians is so full of what is the most important thing in the world, how we're saved, namely by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. The, the book's real emphasis is to unfold to the people of Ephesus the wonders of God's plan for their salvation and for the uniting of all things in Jesus Christ, ultimately. Uh, it's very, very, very clear that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from our deeds, on account of Jesus Christ. That's going to be what we confess as Lutherans in the 1500s over against the Catholic Church. This is what we wrote uh, when we went to the Diet or the, or the con conference, if you will, or whatever at, at Augsburg to talk with the Catholic Church. Likewise, it is taught, we, we teach, the Lutherans, that we cannot obtain forgiveness of sin or righteousness before God through our merit, work, or satisfactions, but that we receive forgiveness of sin and become righteous before God out of grace for Christ's sake through faith when we believe that Christ has suffered for us and that for his sake our sin is forgiven and righteousness and eternal life are given to us. For God will regard and reckon this faith as righteousness in his sight, as St. Paul says in Romans 3 and 4. Okay? There's nothing more important in all the world to, than to know that central doctrine because, as Luther said, the doctrine of justification is the doctrine upon which the church stands or falls. You can have other doctrines, right or wrong, but if you get wrong justification, you're not saved. If you get justification right and hold it fast and believe it, trust in Christ, by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone being saved, then you're saved and you go to heaven. Big difference. So the book of Ephesians is great. I love it because it's so clear on God's grace and how we're saved especially in Ephesians 2. Uh, we're also going to hear in this letter about predestination and election. And we're going to see about how we want and how Paul applies that to the Christian. We don't believe in double predestination, like the Reformed or the Calvinists, which teach that God predestines some for salvation, predestines others to be damned to hell forever, never wanted them saved. No, God desires, friends, all men to be saved and then come to the knowledge of the truth says Paul in one of his letters. And so uh, God so loved the world. So we confess God desires to save all, but the doctrine of election for the Christian is of great comfort and assurance for our hope in Christ. The letter of, uh, sorry. Yes, bless you. The uh, uh, church of Ephesus also did make it into the book of Revelation in terms of one of the seven churches that uh, John the Apostle, Jesus that is, through John, had a message for the church at Ephesus. And at that point in, in history, Ephesus, the church was doing pretty well. It was holding fast the truth. It was not going in any, in any false doctrine. Good for you, Ephesians. Because remember, Paul had warned the Ephesian elders on the beach the last time he saw them. He said, fierce wolves are going to arise among you from your own ranks, teaching perverse things. Hold fast the truth amongst those who are sanctified by faith in Jesus. Okay, so they did hold fast the truth, but in the course of time, they departed from love. They had the truth, but they forgot love. And so Jesus had to come and rebuke them and call them back to love, which I hope they probably, in, when they heard that letter, repented and returned to love, I hope, for a time, at least. All right, anything else we need to know about this before we get going? I think that's about it for the introduction. Yeah, that'll, be, that'll do for now. 
I don't know. None of it remains now. I'd have to look up. Let's see if it says in here. I have some notes on the temple here. Um, Although little remains, the site with its single column and remains of its enormous base is well worth the visit. So you can still see it's a, a single column of it. <laughs> God left one column just as a, uh, a symbol of what he'll do to false religions, uh, just so that pe people can remember it probably. And you can still see its enormous base, but you can't see any of the temple. I don't know, I, I'm not sure who destroyed it. All right, but you can go to modern day Turkey and uh, and uh, that's one of their chief, or maybe their chief artificial archeological site for you to visit and see. Pretty cool. All right, so let's get into the book. Okay, we start with verse one, chapter one. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are also faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's just the start, first two verses. Paul always starts his letters, you know, this way. We always end our letters, love Greg. No, you don't end, put your name at the end in ancient times, you put your name at the beginning, which is kind of a better way to do it. And say, hey, I, this is Paul talking to you, this is Greg talking to you. So it's Paul an apostle. The word apostello uh, in the Greek means this, a sent one. If so if you're an apostle, you are sent. Sent by whom? By God. And Paul makes much of this, that it's not he who set himself up to do this. It was God, Jesus, who called him on the road to Damascus and sent him to go on this great mission to preach him to the world, Jesus. By the will of God, or in the Greek, through the will of God, to the saints who are also faithful in Christ Jesus. Okay, saints who are also faithful in Christ Jesus. That's a great welcome of hospitable uh, warmth to start his letter this way. Do you know that we often as Lutherans, and rightly so in some cases, on a certain angle, always say we're poor, miserable sinners. That's part of our liturgy, right? We confess our sins. I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto thee all my sins and iniquities with, iniquities with which I've ever offended thee. So it's good to remember that, yes, we have a sin nature. It's good to remember and use that when we repent of our sins. But our identity in Christ is not ultimately sinner, but saint. You're saints. You're faithful brethren. You're redeemed by Christ. You should think of yourself as a saint, as forgiven. Saint being uh, one who has been set aside by God for holy purposes. God's own, faithful in Christ Jesus, and grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul always says that. That's the apostolic greeting. Yes? I'm sorry. Well, he, okay, good question. Yeah, he, he had ministered in Ephesus even at one point for three years, I believe. Uh, I do not believe he's in Ephesus at this point because um, just to know, it, it is Paul as the author and he was most likely, it seems, in prison while he's writing this letter. In prison at another place because at the end of the letter, at the end of the letter he says, um, uh, that, uh, pray for me that utterance in me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So some people think he wrote it from Rome. You don't really know exactly, but he was in chains. He was a prisoner. Frankly, frankly, God does a lot of great work in prison, doesn't he? A lot of people get saved in prison, number one. They have a lot of time to read the scriptures. John Bunyan writes the entire Pilgrim's Progress because he got arrested. Paul wrote the, almost the entire New Testament because he got arrested. Yeah, I mean... So he established Ephesus, and then he went on another thing, and then... Came back and visited at times. And then he came back, and then he was in prison, and then he decided to write a letter to it. Yes. Yeah. That's where we are. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And... Uh, so grace and peace 
to you from God. We shouldn't really skip over that too fast. It's the apostolic greeting. That's why most Lutherans, myself included, start the sermons with the apostolic greeting. Sometimes I vary it to make it different, but grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, let's start the sermon now. Why? Well, scripturally, that's how Paul starts all of his letters. That's where that comes from. All right, but grace, God's undeserved favor and, uh, and his favor being a shield to you, grace to you, and peace, namely that's the sum of the gospel to us, the forgiveness of our sins, a peace that passes all understanding. So that you can be like Stephen facing a crowd that wants to kill you and have the face of an angel. Peace to you. Peace from God on high. Peace through Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, and the forgiveness of your sins. Grace and peace to you from God. From God, our Father, our Abba, our Pater in the Greek, our Dad. Because we're all part of the same family. And from the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the second person of the Trinity, our Lord and Savior. Okay. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he destined us. Mine says to be his sons. Actually, in the Greek, it's to be for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. For he's made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. All right, we could spend every day until the Lord comes unfolding and uh, getting into the treasures of these verses. So much in them. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now he starts another letter like that one. Uh, 2 Corinthians, he also, Peter starts a letter like that one. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter says, by his great mercy, we've been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance, etc. Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Starts out with a praise of God, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Okay, in the heavenlies, actually, I think is the, in, the, uh, in the Greek there. In Christ, yes. All the promises of God find their yes in Jesus for us. So, what has God withheld from you? What is he holding back on? How much does God measure out his love to you? In complete, full, uh, pouring out like Niagara Falls. He hasn't withheld anything from you in the spiritual, heavenly places. On earth, we have to go through a few things for a while where he tests us and makes us go through trials and we have suffered times of want in order to test us and refine us like fire. But in spiritual heavenly places, nothing has been withheld from you. And he's planning in the worlds to come to bless you with everything he has. As the Holy Spirit's job is to take what is mine, Jesus says, and declare it to you. He's going to declare everything to you. In the heavenly places. Mm-hmm. What would some of those blessings be? Can you name some? Spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. Peace. Peace, good one. Yeah. Joy. Love. Yep. Power, wealth, wisdom, might, um, peace, grace, joy, all the fruits of the Spirit, salvation, an inheritance, a place prepared for you in the kingdom, Adoption of sons, power, the Holy Spirit, everything in the Holy Spirit. Mm. I mean, God, who has everything, he is the creator, has now given everything to you spiritually through Jesus Christ, his son. We should ponder that tonight as we go to sleep. What? I mean, this, this is not just a little bit of stuff. This is, this is everything. 
and we're going to talk about the plan of God, is ultimately he wants you to be his own sons, adopted with full right, legal rights as sons of him, who is king over everything. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So here we come into the doctrine of election. When did God love you? When did God choose you? When were you in his mind the first time? Before he founded the earth. Before he even created the seas. He had Bill and Julene, and Rich and Joy, Greg. He had each of us in mind. He knew us by name. He chose us. He elected us. He, uh, egg, where is it? Chose is the word ek lego in the Greek. He, it, means, it can mean to choose out from, to select for oneself, to choose from among, to choose for some purpose. He chose us. It says here, in him, in Jesus, before he founded the world, before the foundation of the world, and he chose us with a purpose. What was the purpose? That, yep, that we should be, that is, through the Christ, holy and blameless before him. In other words, without sin, perfectly righteous. How can that be since we're sinners? I was going to get into how terrible sinners we were in chapter 2. But then God loved us anyway and sent his son Jesus to make us without blemish, to make us holy, to reckon righteousness to us, forgive us our sins, and then send his Holy Spirit to cause us to start to become and walk after active righteousness, becoming and living a holy life and a blameless life. Even though we're never going to be perfect in this world, we're works in progress, the Spirit making us from one degree of glory to another like Christ, but God's making you holy and without blemish, perfect. In Jesus, he chose you for that, predestined you for it before the foundation of the world. By the way, we already have all of our blessings in spiritual heavenly places. I like what I, this one commentator said. Is that the Christian really operates in two spheres then. The human sphere and the divine. The earthly and the heavenly places the visible and, in the vi and invisible at the same time. Physically, the Christian is on earth in a human body, but spiritually, he's seated with Christ in the heavenly sphere. That's strange, isn't it? That we're actually called, you'll see it later in the letter, seated with Christ right now where he is. We're so connected with him that when he's seated at the right hand of power, somehow we're also there spiritually, while we're also really here at the same time. The, this commentator says, uh, and, and it's the heavenly sphere that provides the power and direction for an earthly walk. He says, for example, the, or maybe I said this, or this uh, some time ago, the President of the United States. <laughs> let's, let's just harken back to days when we liked all these things and it was more of a normal world, okay? Because I know we think installed President Biden and all, and the 2020 election and all that kind of stuff. But just go with the illustration. The President of the United States is not always seated at his desk in the White House, but that executive, that executive chair represents the sphere of his life and power. No matter where he is, he's the president, because only he has the privilege of sitting at that desk. It's as if he's always sitting at that desk, no matter where he goes, because it's the seat of power. Likewise, with the Christian, no matter where he may be on this earth, he is seated in the heavenly places with Jesus Christ and this is the basis of his life and power. Remember last week we preached on the ascension? That's, if you read the New Testament, see how many times Jesus ascending to the right hand of God is emphasized throughout by the apostles and the writers of the New Testament. We don't think about it so much, but they are always talking about where he is now. Right hand of God, power, ruling all things, and we're seated with him. We are in a position of power, not weakness, when we're dealing with the world and with the evil ones. We're in a position already of victory, not defeat. All the devil has left is lies and deceit. He's been disarmed and made a public spectacle of, according to Colossians 2. 
So we've got to get that attitude when we're facing the intimidations of the bully, the devil, and his minions, that they are just full of hot air, ultimately, for the Christian. They have power against the wicked ones, the evil, the unbelievers, but against the Christian, they can come and attack us and all that stuff, but they have no power to overthrow us because we're in the position of power. We're seated with Christ in heavenly places where He is, and Christ is our Lord at our head. Okay, so he chose you before he founded the world. The doctrine of election. How should we use the doctrine of election? Well, let's read a little further here, the next verse. In love, he destined us. So in the Greek, so in, in my RSV translation, it says he destined us in love. That's fine, but... In the Greek, it's probably better in the ESV translation. In love is the first word, are the first words of that sentence. And in Greek, it's very important how you position the words in the sentence. For emphasis, you throw the more important thing right at the start a lot of times. So it's in love he destined us. Not just he destined us, well, afterthought, in love. No, in love, because he loved you. He chose you before the foundation of the world. In love he destined. Because it's all about the love of God for you. Because He's good. He chose to do these things for you. To take unholy people and make them holy. People with blemishes and to make them without blemish through Christ. And to make you His own sons. Let's read it. He, in love, in love, He destined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. Okay? So... Okay. He destined you in agape. Predestined you. Pro orizo. He decided from the beginning. He decided from beforehand. He predestined you. He set you apart from the beginning beforehand. Decided on it, on it beforehand. Determined in advance. Determined beforehand. Predestined and preordained you for what? For adoption as sons. Huiothesia in the Greek. Adoption as a son. Remember, Romans 8, you didn't receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons. When we cry, Abba, Father, it's the Spirit Himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, uh, fellow, uh, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified in him, with him. So, God adopts you as his children. We are to suffer with Christ and we are heirs since we are children of God and sons of God of what? The inheritance. What inheritance? Christ's inheritance. What was God going to give to Jesus? Everything he has. What are we with Christ? Co-heirs of what? Everything God has. He plans, because he's a loving God, to give everything to you as sons. That's what fathers do, do for their children and their sons when they come of age. Give them an inheritance. All things. That's what God has in, plan, in mind for you. And it's revealed to us here in the scriptures. And it's great to be a son because we can call God our Abba, our Father. Very close, very intimate. Yahweh, right? Lynn, we, we say that in our prayers. Use the actual word name of God, uh, call him by name, he calls you by name. Okay. Through Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said when he was raised from the dead, I'm ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Just like with Ruth and Naomi, your God shall be my God and where you die I shall die, etc., to be a son through Jesus Christ. That's how we get born again, by the Spirit, according to the purpose of His will. So God is effecting a plan, a purpose. He's driving it forward in Christ, and His plan is to do something great for you in love. First, to exalt Jesus, His Son, as head over all in the kingdom, and then to make a kingdom for Him, which is made up of human beings, which is you. The purpose of His will to the praise of His glorious grace, which He freely bestowed on us and the Beloved. 
Why did God do all this to save you? Love. Absolutely. And he wanted to save you. But also, he had something else in mind. The praise of his glorious grace. He wants everybody to praise him for what kind of a God he is. He's putting on display one of his favorite characteristics about himself. Grace, to pass over sins, to be forgiving, to be merciful, to be kind and gentle, and to forgive, to pass over, to let go, to set people free, to rescue. Uh, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he freely bestowed on us and the beloved. By the way, you're going to see, I will highlight this more next week, but this happens a couple of times. The praise of his glorious grace. Where is it? I have my notes here. In, uh, in this verse, he saved us according to the praise of his glorious grace, Ephesians 1.6. When we get to Ephesians 1.12, he's going to give us the inheritance that we should be to the praise of his glory. In Ephesians 1.14, why has God the Spirit sealed us and become the guarantee of our future blessing? Under the praise of his glory. Again, three times, it's to the glory of God. That's another reason why he saved us. Because he, he is the true God. His glory gives to no other. He's showing what a marvelous God he is and we should be giving him praise. That's one of his purposes. Then to exalt his son. Because he loves his son, he's going to be the hero for all time. Forever and eternity. And he loves you and wants you to be his own children and give you all things because he loves you and loves to give generously and cheerfully to his own and even to all if they would come. To the praise of his glorious grace, Grace is what? Charis. Uh, it's, in the Greek, it's your God's undeserved kindness and favor to you sinners, to us sinners. So the Catholic Church is going to say that grace is something God infuses into you and to make you work and earn your own salvation, getting to heaven by your own righteousness, ultimately. Well, God does infuse a grace into us also that we do will and work for his good pleasure, but the grace that saves us is... The grace chiefly that is God's undeserved kindness and mercy towards you and me. We're sinners, slaves of our passions, completely dead in our trespasses, but God loved you anyway, destined you to be saved, sent Christ to save you. This is his undeserved grace, kindness, and mercy to, to set you free and redeem you, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Jesus is the beloved. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. He said it as baptism. And it was freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Freely bestowed on us. Let's see if I can find the word for that. But anyway, it's, that's a good translation. I like that translation. He has just poured out upon us, not because we deserved any of it. He just delighted to give it. The word is charetao. To give grace, highly favor, and highly honor. To freely bestow on us these things. Let's just do, uh, we're, we're going to have to close here. Let's just do, yeah. What? Yeah. Right. Took all our sin and guilt on, on himself. Mm -hmm. Right, Romans 5, yeah. 
Right. Amen. Yeah. God shows us. To think that you're predestined for salvation is a wonderful comfort to the Christian. We'll talk a little bit more about that maybe next week. And it's all driven in love. He's in love. He's driving these things. He didn't cause Adam to fall, but he knew he would fall. Jesus was already destined, like you say, before the foundation of the world to be the Savior, to be the rescuer of mankind, the Redeemer. But he was manifested at the ends of, end of times for your sake, says Peter. It's all driven in love. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, we have a free will for a lot of things, you know, what cheeseburger or you know, no bacon or stuff like that. When it comes to salvation, it's amazing. God, I mean, I mean we have a bound will, really, too, don't we? I mean, that so we are not able to call Him, but the Holy Spirit calls us by the gospel and enlightens us with the gifts, works faith in our hearts, and even, even that is part of His predestining, driving love to say, I'm going to bring this person alive and give them faith in me to receive my grace. It's, wow, the amazing great love of God for you and me. And we'll just read this next verse. We'll talk about it next week, but we just can't stop there. We just have to read one more verse. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. Like Niagara Falls, non-stopping, full, huge cataracts, columns of water, just volumes pouring upon you, Non-stop, continually, more than enough is going to be what Paul says in the Greek. More than enough, over, over abundantly lavishing upon you salvation in Jesus Christ. This is 